Because today, brethren, I'd like to tell you a love story. Now, for all you guys out there, for all you manly men, I don't want to see your eyes glaze over and your head <laughs> rock back at this point. Because love is something that we are built to feel and to need. It's a powerful thing that we are created to feel and to need. We've heard about our mothers, physical and spiritual. Consider the love of a parent for their child, and I'll point it toward the mother as we so often look at that as the stronger of the two relationships or bonds. But a mother in both soul and body is created to protect and to nurture and to feed and to care for deeply that loving child. She strokes the child, she talks to the child, she sings to that baby, and that all happens before she ever looks into its eyes. In her womb, she talks and dreams and, and cuddles with, before she ever looks into those eyes or wraps those little fingers around her, around her hand itself. Brethren, we as first fruits future sons and daughters of God, have a loving spiritual parent in heaven as well. And he feels that same way about us. He lovingly nurtures and guides and comforts and sometimes even has to correct us so that we grow up to successfully fulfill our destiny that he's invited us to, guides us toward, and prays we hold on to. According to one of the dictionaries I use from time to time, a love story by definition revolves around two people as they develop love for each other and as they build a relationship. And such stories, to be more successful, generally have to have an emotionally satisfying and optimistic ending. So again, the development of love, the building of a relationship, and a satisfying, emotionally successful ending. As we go through the message today, we'll see that that is indeed the story that we've been invited to play a role in. The Apostle John summarizes God's character in three simple words in 1 John 4, 8, and repeated again in verse 16. That's 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, and repeated again in verse 16, he says, God is love. God is love. And therefore, by extrapolation, and as we go through the, the passages, we'll, we'll begin to understand that a little more fully, that God's dealings with us are all, therefore, motivated by His love for us. Whether He's showing care, concern, blessings, promises, notice the hand gestures, or even when it is that He needs to correct us. We know that all of them are intended to lead us to receive that gift of eternal life as members of God's family. So today I would like us to consider the love that God has and continues to show toward mankind. As he works out the plan of action, he set in motion to draw us to him and to lead us toward becoming his kids. How much, brethren, does God love us? We talked about our, the church as our mother. We talked about the physical relationships we have, the, the feelings that we have. But we also heard Mr. Brown yesterday talk about the fact that we need to get busy. We need to get to work. We heard Mr. Lambert this morning talk about the fact that these acts of love and preparing for people and thinking of people, being concerned for their future and their safety and their well-being and their, their general emotional comfort, is an act of love, it's an act of service. We know that Jesus Christ lived a life of service. And therefore, we're going to go through a number of passages today that show us just how much God has given to us and for us. How does God express His love for us? First, let's consider God's decision to create human beings at all. You know, He didn't need us, and yet He set in motion a plan from the very beginning to make a place for you and I. And that's where we need to make sure that we always make this personal. That we don't read our Bible as, you know, okay, it's a, it's a story of someone else. Or it's a set of instructions, like a textbook, that we kind of make impersonal. Instead, we need to make sure that we're putting our name in there, that we're seeing the impact of our lives, to realize where we came from and where we have yet to go. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34. 
asking the question of how does God, how much does he love us and how does he express that love for us? Here on this day of Pentecost, realizing all those various themes we have, the history behind us and the promise of the future before, how much does God love us? What has he prepared for us and given to us so far and yet still ahead? Matthew chapter 25 and verse 34, this passage looks to the future, but it refers to when God set that plan in motion. It says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So as the, as the cement in those foundations was still drying, there was a plan for us. As that house was built, that future was planned, our name tags were on the shelf waiting for our doors, our rooms, our mansions, our offices, our roles to come to fruition and be fulfilled. As they made that initial plan, God knew that what to expect initially from these rather wayward kids. But because of his love for us and his desire to share everything with others, he's inviting us to become sons and daughters in his family. You won't hear, hopefully, anything new today. But again, when you hear something wrapped in a story that's a little different and it's a perspective and it's a color, what we do is we rehear, we review the truths that God has given us and built deep within us over years, for most of us, years of experience. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17, talking about sons and daughters in his family. Talking about this love story and the relationship built, the love that's built and developed, and the happy ending, the successful ending that wraps it all up in a nice bow. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 it's there, it says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord, and do not touch the unclean thing. And if you'll do those, he then comes on to finish the thought, and I will receive you, and I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Even as they developed that plan before creation, God the Father and the one who would become Jesus Christ knew that to transform human beings because of their frailty, because of the temptation that they were generally unable to withstand, and certainly with the powers that fight and, and drive and drag against us, they knew that Christ would have to sacrifice his life for humanity's sins. You can read about that in chapter or in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. I'm going to cover a lot of chapters today, brethren, so hopefully your pen your refill has got enough ink. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 refers to Christ as the Lamb who was slain from the foundation of the world. So again, as we say, what has God done for me so far and what yet still has to play out? And what we realize is they set a plan in motion that was thorough, that was complete, that started right from the front, that had, we'll get into Jesus Christ and the role he played, and then the helper that is sent to bridge between that first and that second coming and take us into eternity. How much they have given to us and shown love toward us. That sacrifice of the Lamb is the greatest ever demonstration of love and it was the ultimate sacrifice that both God the Father, we realize what he gave up, and Jesus Christ made for each of us. John chapter 3 verse 16. Again, so many of these are ones that you might pull out of your memory. John chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, For God so loved, getting back to that love story, that concept of what has been done for us, and really as we follow through, as we read the story, we realize that we are to be reflecting that character. And therefore, we're supposed to be practicing the same type of things that were given to us to make sure that we are that light on a hill, that we are an example of a true disciple. Instead of, well, gimme, 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 thank you for all the love, and then I go over here and I, you know, Scrooge McDuck, he locks it down in his basement and swims in his cash. No, we're supposed to be happy and loving and giving and sharing to make sure that the world around us gets a taste of what it's supposed to be like. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life life. So that was the reason the plan started, 
That was the way in which it was allowed to perpetuate, that the door could be open to us, and that lays out for us what the future is. Verse 17 says, the world, that the world might be saved through him. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9, continuing on this thought, or, or laying alongside it as we, we build scripture upon scripture. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 9 says, In this was manifested, manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Again, remember that God didn't need us. That family could have remained forever too. And yet that wasn't their desire. That wasn't their love. They had a, they had a plan to, to perpetuate the family, to expand the family, to smile on those that would join as they welcomed them through the door in, in open arms. God reveals himself and he helps us to come to know him and Jesus Christ, his son, through the love that he shows for us and the things that they do for us. John chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. So from the beginning they realized what needed to be done. The steps were solidly in place. And again, then we, we don't just take that for granted. We look to the various scriptures and we, we, we make that rock solid in our mind. We prove those things to ourselves so that we're ready to give an answer when that opportunity might come, when somebody asks. John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we know that that word grace means unmerited, or undeserved pardon. We heard the story of Valdor's release, and again, he, he had to do his time. We, on a spiritual level, have been forgiven of that. Someone else has done our time, paid our price for us. And so we look forward to that, and we embrace that, and we forever hold on to that, trying extremely hard to make sure that we don't ever cheapen it or break it. And brethren, we know we do. It says all have fallen short, all have sinned, all have broken God's expect expectations. And yet that payment on our behalf is capable of paying each and every one of every one's down through time. Through grace, God pronounced us justified and righteous and free of sin as a result of Christ's sacrifice. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. I mentioned this just a moment ago. It says, For all have sinned. This is Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so there again, that was the, the creation and the guarantee that was made in there. The ransom that was paid for us so that we might have, indeed, a future. As we consider these verses, we can think back to that definition, again, of the love story. When we see somebody do something for us that we don't deserve, do something for us that is truly done out of the goodness of their heart, and we see that that is that that love, that is that concern, that is the relationship of two or more in this case. We know billions ultimately are involved in this story in various chapters and times, but ultimately it's the building of a relationship, it's the showing of love, and it's the satisfying and optimistic ending that we look forward to. We can turn to other verses, such as Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7, again, continuing on that idea of how God shows love for us. And this shows God in a physical standpoint with the children of Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 7. It said, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all these people. We heard earlier, we talked of grace and the unmerited, the undeserved part. Why was it that the nation of Israel was the chosen one? That was God's decision. But again, what we see is that God has not chosen the outstanding. Instead, he chose a small people to make his point to this world. Verse 8, But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of slaves from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. So we see here that God's love is indeed a gift. Like His grace, not something predicated on anything we've done, 
We are indeed reminded of that also from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26. Read a few verses from, uh, from chapter 1, beginning in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians. It says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men, according to the flesh, are called, not many mighty, not many noble, not those titans of industry, as I sometimes refer to them, but God has chosen the foolish things, like that small and, and uh, you know, they, they went into, um, into bondage, small, rather unimportant nation. We see it on a personal basis here as we look forward and then try to understand the spiritual side. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and sometimes that's not easy to take. I don't like to consider myself foolish. I try real hard not to play the fool. And yet still I open my mouth and stick my foot in it from time to time. But God says, you know what, when you're quiet, when you stand humbly and consider yourself truly in the scope of my creation, what does it say in the Psalms? When, you know, where were you when I hung the stars? When I spread my canopy in the, in the heavens? Where were you? But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. Finishing it, or dropping down verse 29, he says, and his purpose, so that no flesh should glory in his presence. We have to make sure that we keep our attitude, our heart in the right place, when we realize what he's given for us, what he's done for us. And so each and every day, we should be thankful, grateful, appreciative, and trying to follow the instructions to say, well, I have had great love shown to me, how do I show it? How do I pay it forward? We should marvel at that love and patience and grace toward, grace toward each of us. You know, David portrays the loving parental nature of God in Psalm 23 when he said in, in verse 1, Psalm 23 and verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You know, there are times I've been giving, and this really kind of falls into that lecture or that sermon series on the fruits of the Spirit. When we talk about joy, and we talk about peace, and we talk about patience, and we sometimes find ourselves in a situation where those are hard to, to practice. Whether it's our own background, our own baggage, our own character and personality, or whether it's somebody else persecuting us, God says, frankly, I don't care. Practice joy. Find peace. Make peace. Show love toward others, even when they persecute you. But David, through the poetry of this passage, likens himself to a humble lamb that looks to that keeper for all his needs, for his very survival. You know, shepherds are described through, through Scripture as loving and caring. Sometimes we see them as the humble, quiet, you know, they're just they're walking and nothing's going on. But at the same time, we know that they have to be fearless, and they have to be strong, and they have to be a survivor, and they have to be a protector. And so David recognized all of that and painted that picture for us when he said, The Lord is my shepherd. How much indeed does God love us? Psalm chapter 146 and verse 5. Talking about the love of God and the way he recognizes these, these humble beings that he has created. We heard in the messages today that God's intent is that none of them fall short of accepting the invitation that he is indeed making to each and every one of us. In their time, and we have indeed been blessed to be drawn and shown extra love as first fruits, but we have to realize that every interaction we have, every word, every moment of anger or impatience that we show to someone else is really showing to a future brother or sister. Showing God's love from Psalm chapter 146 and verse 5. It says, Blessed is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose help is in the Lord his God. That God is the one who made the heavens and earth and the sea and all that is in it, and who keeps truth forever, who carries out judgment for the mistreated, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord lets the prisoners loose. I heard that story today. And the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves righteousness. It's one of the ways that we show love back to Him when we work on those fruits of the Spirit. When we work on bringing our temper and anger and our need for justice under control and show patience 
and show respect and show honor and make peace and find joy. And sometimes it's simply by being wise enough to walk away. But that's what we are to become. God loves the righteous. Verse 9, the Lord preserves the strangers. He relieves the orphan and the widow. But the way of the wicked, I love, the again, the Psalms, the, the colorful uh, terminology the way I have here. But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. Sometimes it feels like they're winning. Sometimes it seems like they're blessed. And they have more than us. And you say, Father, how is that fair? Fair doesn't always come into his calculations. Because he's working a longer term result than what we might think of in this given day. But he turns the way of the wicked upside down. Recall that I earlier mentioned in passing that even God's correction is based on his love for us. His concern that we come to understand and follow his instructions to the letter and more importantly in the spirit. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. We begin to wrap up this first section that answers the question, how does God show love for us? How much has God done for us? If we, if we kind of break these here and say there's God the Father and all his planning and what he did and the specific roles that Jesus Christ played in it, and then as disciples, as these developing kids, what are we supposed to be doing? And how do we make sure that we mirror and model that? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor lose courage when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines him who he loves, and chastises every son whom he receives. So sometimes it's even in the correction that we see love. You know, I, I, I didn't truly understand or accept it when, when my dad would say, so I'm just going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I truly don't think so. But as a father, correction is necessary. You want to touch that hot stove? I'd rather take that pain than the permanent scarring that can come from a parent saying, I'm willing to create a little correction in order to make sure that you're really taken care of in the long run. Brethren, as we gather on this Feast of Pentecost, Let's be intimately aware of the love that God has shown to us. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1 is the, is the last passage in this particular section. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Behold, what manner of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. That we would have that opportunity and that future reserved for us. We read earlier how Jesus Christ came to the earth as our Savior to pay the price that no one else could pay. To make that guarantee. To pay that ransom. Another role that he filled during the time that he was here was to show us how more fully, on a physical sense, to show love. To be love. To be the right example. To be able to draw people by the way we do and say and show and care for them. They may not understand God. They've never had the background or they've been misdirected. And so it's as a neighbor, as a co-worker, that we show somebody some unmerited, undeserved, unnecessary love. And they're like, wow, that was, that was special. That was unnecessary. That was, that was from the heart. I wish I would be more like that. That's much of what we learned and learn from the example, the physical life of Jesus Christ here on this, on this earth. Through his teachings and through his example, that godly love is based, we see, on deep, outgoing concern for others. You know, that's often the definition we use. Love is outgoing concern for the well-being of others. Whether they, in our heart, in this moment, deserve it or not, if we show love, we are more like Jesus Christ than our Father in Heaven. And also, not just outgoing concern, well, you know, I'm, I'm concerned for Him, I really don't want to see Him trip over that or slip on that ice, but do we then have the desire to serve? To truly make sure to show the act along with the feeling. 
That's what Jesus Christ did constantly. Outgoing concern for and a generous desire to serve others. Jesus Christ was a living, breathing, perfect model of how it is or how it was to be lived and shown toward others. And so as we read his example in the pages of the Bible, we find out how to superimpose that on our life today. What am I, what am I doing today? Am I, am I going to work? Do I have some grumpy old fellow who lives next door to me? And you know what? It'd be a whole lot easier not to say hello. But that lawn is getting long. And he can't do it. What would Jesus Christ do in that situation? And do I show that generous desire to serve others? Again, we can superimpose all those parables. Every large and small word. We are to live by every word of the scriptures. And how well do we do when we consider our, our story, our example? We all know the story from Matthew chapter 22 where Christ was asked, which was the great or the most important commandment? And again, what we're doing is moving into a section here where we look at Jesus Christ and his teachings and his example to us, his instructions to us, if you will. Talking about Matthew chapter 22, now we realize that those two great commandments that Jesus provided in his reply were not new. Many people don't realize it, but Jesus Christ's responses both refer to Old Testament teachings. And so as this, this man of education, as this lawyer asked him the question, when he got the first answer, I, I think he fully expected it. You know, that was a quote from the Shema. That's what something that he uttered every day. It was, it was the routine that showed that he was a pious man. And yet Jesus Christ took it a step further. And he kind of really got him in the backside by tying the physical as well as showing it to God and showing the higher end of things. Again, by pulling them together, Jesus Christ elevated the treatment of our fellow human beings to a level not previously taught or accepted by, by many people. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter 22, beginning in verse 35. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35. Again, recognize if we were able to have the opportunity to ask questions of Jesus Christ like this, if we were in his presence as the disciples had been, what would you ask? And yet when we turn to the pages of the Bible, if we were to ask those questions, the answers are there. If we will simply search them out, as I know we all do. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 35, it says, Then one of them, a lawyer, starts to put a certain flavor on it. I don't know if any of you have a law background. Sorry if uh, I don't mean any offense. I know some wonderful people that are. But then one of them, a lawyer, asked, and this is where we understand the, the context, tempting him, and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul and with all your mind, with all your being, he should be first. He has done great things and promised great things to us, and he should be first. This is the answer that this troublemaker probably expected. Again, since Jesus was quoting from Deuteronomy 6, it's part of the law that he had known. He had, he had grown up, or at least for some period of his life, he had made his position by knowing these things. It was a passage that the Pharisees knew very well. But then Jesus went beyond what was specifically asked, because, you know, that first, that first statement answered the question, what is the greatest? And yet Jesus Christ, without skipping a beat, said, there's more to it, guys. There's more to it. And I knew you weren't looking for answer number two, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Verse 39. And the second, he said, is like it, because you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You know, it's... When somebody says, you know, I, I don't have physical contact with God. God is a, a, a theory, a, a being. Um, so to show honor and, and respect to him, okay, well, I'm going to do it this way. The law tells me I should do this. So I, I say all the sayings and I wear all the, the things. And yet where the rubber meets the road is each and every day people we interact with. And so what he did was he gave them a, a second punch here. This wasn't a new commandment either, since Jesus was quoting from Leviticus 19. But by combining them in this way, Jesus Christ said, with your very fiber, just the way you serve God, 
you should be willing to show love, to serve, to generously give without going concern to the people that you come in contact with. And others didn't know it yet at the time, but it's because of that concept that I mentioned earlier that every person we come in contact with, the people we make smile, sometimes because we like them, we get along with them, and therefore it's easier, and the people that we don't. Do we show that outgoing concern and that generous desire to serve others? That's what Jesus Christ was putting on the table for him. And then he went on to make the closing comment in verse 40. Because he tied the two of them together, and before they could dis, disrespect one, before they could discount that second res, response, he said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And these fat Pharisees and Sadducees, they were very educated people. They were very powerful and influential people. They knew the laws. They knew how people looked on them and judged them and what they had to do and say and look like in order to make sure that they maintained and yet what Jesus Christ tied them down was, in the same way that you so worry about all that, is how you treat every man and woman you come in contact with. Jesus reinforced this concept of love your neighbor. He said it is a stronger requirement than the Pharisees had previously considered. And that's something that we need to consider very carefully as his disciples. Are we doing what we can and should to show the love of God to those around us? We need to ask that question specifically. Because we can go around and tell ourselves, and again, I don't mean to be beating you up, brethren. You need to be asking yourselves these questions. Because I speak with a mirror before me. We've, we've often said that as speakers. We, we have something that we know that we're working on. And so it's working, it's churning, it's, it's perking in the back of our minds. And so it begins to take life as a message. And so as we study and as we try to better understand and as we try to, again, make sure we're asking the right questions of us, you're our brothers and sisters that need to be asking those same questions and living those same ways. Again, it's something we need to consider very carefully. Do we show love to God and Christ by showing love to those around us? In the book of Luke, Jesus provided some clarity in this concept. We've there have been some conversations recently about what it is that we might do as a congregation or what we should be doing as individuals or, or what the church has done, um, you know, at a higher level, um, thinking administratively. Do we go out and serve in soup kitchens? Do we, are we trying to be visible in the community? But we look at Jesus Christ and he served in every opportunity that was presented to him. He served those that weren't even looking for it and didn't know it. He brought to us the story of the, of the uh, Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10 and verse 29. And he told the story which shows that God wants us to regard everyone as our neighbor, whom we should gladly assist if we are able. The conversation that recently took place said, well, does that mean you'd pick up a hitchhiker? There is wisdom to be had. You know, if I, I'm driving by and I see a, a car with its flashers on, and a quarter mile later, I see somebody walk in with their suit coat over their arm, and I make a connection, and I said, you know, I can help that person. And the person is maybe not by definition a hitchhiker, but I, I have the opportunity to serve. You see flashers on, somebody's got a flat tire. I, I, the, the question of wisdom goes through my mind, because you hear stories of where people pull their car over and put their flashers on and let the air out of their tire, and they've got a gun here waiting for someone to take advantage of them, to steal their car or whatever. So we do have to be wise. But to slow down, to check traffic, to slow down, to put your window down, do you need to make a phone call? Do you, no, I, I, that so often has happened. No, I'm, I got AAA, they're on their way, or my family's coming. Okay, thanks. Just wanted to make sure you weren't stuck out here without some way of getting assistance. So we have to be smart, but do we help? The conversation went through the fact that, well, what if somebody, you know, somebody walks up and, they, you know, they're kind of, what's, what's that, grifter, or what's the word, where somebody comes up just asking for money, and he may very well have a Cadillac parked around the corner. But at that moment, do you have an opportunity to serve? With all the information that you have, do you have the opportunity, and are you in a position to serve? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. And some will say, well, I don't know, maybe he's going to use it to go get booze or go get drugs. And Okay, well, 
If you've got a few minutes, then come on, I'll walk you across the street and I'll get you a burger. And it takes out the opportunity for him to use it the way he wants it, or, or her. But again, are we willing? Or have we, like this world, become callous? Have we put up our armor and say, you know what, someone else. That's what the parable of the Good Samaritan was. How many people walked by, hesitated, saw, clearly understood, and justified why they wouldn't? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves each and every day when we consider the love shown to us and how, in that perfect righteous character and those fruits of the Spirit, how do we perform? How are we doing? What does it take? What little bit more could we do? Brethren, that would be an effective point to meditate on in the coming days, to consider if we are serving as we are able. I mentioned some of the conversations that have taken place lately about how it is we should serve. And I offered to the congregation to say if, if having an organized thing of, okay, you know what, on a quarterly basis we can go down to the food kitchen and we can serve as a group, we fellowship amongst ourselves, we help others, that's all good. If we're all very busy and we have children, we have houses and we have spouses maybe that don't, don't uh, attend, and so if that's too much of a structure, then each of us can find ways to do that on our, on our own. I, much, I mentioned the grumpy old man that might be next door. But if we don't serve, if we don't show love, if we don't truly have that outgoing concern, is the person next door looking at us as the grumpy old man? Or do they truly see us as disciples of Jesus Christ by the way we live our lives and the way we serve others around us? God says that he takes particular interest in the widows and the orphans. Can we find some small way to make their lives easier this summer? Twice in Matthew chapter 25 we read, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it, as you did it not to the least of one of these, you did it not to me. And we read it in other passages to say, as you served the least of one of these, you you know, when I saw, when did I see you naked and in prison and when you saw someone else in that situation and you took the time to give, it's as if you did it to me. Questions that we should be asking ourselves. Now I'm not trying to shame anyone into joining the Big Brothers program, brethren, but what if we gave up 30 minutes of sleep once in a while to write a letter or a personal email to someone on the church's prayer list? We send cards as a congregation, and that's nice. I can sign my name and thinking of you. But what would it take for you to just go to bed 30 minutes later and sit down with a piece of paper and write a letter? To get more personal, if you will. We talked about Pierre Carinard, who longs for the fellowship of God's people. Or maybe there's someone that you met at the feast last year that you haven't thought of in eight months and they could use an emotional boost. Just a thought, because the efforts on our part won't change the direction of this sorry world, but they may have a powerful and lasting impact for those that are on the receiving end. Jesus put even greater pressure on all of us to show the love of God, even when it isn't easy to do so. Still in the book of Matthew, this time in chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, and I touched on this earlier. You know, when we, uh, when we have fun people that live next door, they've got a boat and they take us out fishing or, or jet skiing in the summer. Yeah, I, you know, I love those. Those people, are, they're great. That's easy. What do we do when it takes a little bit more? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. You have heard it said, again, remember that Jesus Christ told, answered that lawyer saying, love God, but love your neighbor. They come in the same breath, and all the law and the prophets hang on those two things. Matthew 5, verse 43, he says, You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor, okay, and apparently hate your enemy. That, that's easy to do. Very often we feel that sense of justice and fairness. <clears throat> but I say to you, love your enemies, and bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Earlier in the passage, it talked about the man that would take you to court, 
where the person that would take your tunic, your jacket, he said, you know what, slide out of it and give him your shirt too. If they would pressure you to go a mile, go too. In other places it talks about heaping coals on the head of those that would take advantage when we turn about and show them love. You take the wind out of your sails, you set a wonderful example, and you're enlightened in your heart as well. Verse 45, so he says, okay, despitefully use you and persecute you in verse 44. Again, something difficult to do. But if we're developing the fruits of the Spirit, if we're developing that righteous character, it becomes easier to do. Because we know we have no choice. We know it's what Jesus Christ did. We know it's the way we need to become to make that final step. Verse 45, so we do those things so that you may become sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Why does it do that? He said earlier that he would turn the lives upside down, those who are wicked. But even those wicked, when they will repent, are forgiven. And they're back on track with us. Maybe not a first fruit, they're going to have their opportunity. But remember, God is sending that sunrise and he's sending that rain on each and every one of his future sons and daughters. And so when we can look at it that simply, that carte blanche, instead of that so and so no good, I'll get them back for what they did to me yesterday. Satan, get behind me. Because that's not what I'm supposed to do. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? You know, somebody who's despised by everybody else still goes home and finds love at home. Still loved by his kids. They run up and say, Daddy. So loving those that are easy is one thing. Verse 47, if you greet your brothers only, what do you do more than others? It says that we are to show love to all men, especially to the house of God. Yes, when we know these people very well, we know what the needs are and how we can serve. But that same radar, that same awareness ought to be up to those around us, to our community, to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our family that doesn't come to church, and the opportunity that we have to serve. Verse 48, therefore be perfect. We are to become holy. Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So if that's what God would do, if that's what our elder brother Jesus Christ would do, and we're supposed to become more like Him, we're just supposed to develop all that beautiful and heavy hanging fruit that looks just like them, that's what we need to do. Christ made it clear that godly love requires action on our part, and perhaps a little discomfort at times, because it won't be easy but it'll be the most fulfilling, perhaps, because it wasn't easy. All these people we come in contact will have the chance someday to learn God's truth and to answer His invitation to become sons and daughters as well. The interesting question that I thought of as I was developing this message is, what if next week some of them walk through our doors and they've interacted with us before and we've been the one that saw the Samaritan and justified walking by. Do they see the love of God when they walk in that door and see our hand, see our faces? Or do we go like, oh man, I gotta go to the men's room like <laughs> someone else is gonna have to be the one that greets them and sticks their hands out because I, I gotta make sure they're in a good mood before they get to me. Or they're gonna be, wow, well, they'll let anybody in this group, won't they? What does our example set? Will they look at us and recall their brush with righteousness and love and willing service? Christ lived a perfect life and he set a perfect example of love and patience and kindness and faithfulness. As that young man said in the United Youth Camp video, he said, the fruits of the Spirit sum up God. And therefore they should sum us up. And by extension we know they, they sum up Jesus Christ as well. In John chapter 13 and verse 34, Jesus said, A new command I give you. Love one another. That, that wasn't new. But he went on to say, As I have loved you, so you must love one another.
the same way he said, my peace I give to you. Not the peace as the world gives it to you, but my peace. Jesus Christ had been here and set the example for us, shown us how to elevate and reach for the spirit of the law as well and show that righteousness to others. So he said, as I have loved, you should love. As I give peace, it's mine. It's a deeper, a richer, a fuller, a higher peace. Those are the things we reach for. Those are the things we seek to develop. Jesus Christ then went on to set the example of continual, continually doing good. You know, he showed his willingness to serve, to teach, to encourage, to heal the sick, to comfort the oppressed. And it's all put down in black and white for us. And Mr. Brown, again yesterday, instructed us that we need to get busy. It was a call to action in his, in his message. Mr. Lambert's this morning was a similar one. When we look at what is it that we can do, we see from Christ's teaching an example that godly love is deep, outgoing concern for and the generous desire of giving to others. Brethren, so far we've looked at how God the Father and Jesus Christ have shown great love toward mankind, and particularly toward each of us, again, as we make it that personal love story for each and every one of us. And one of those great acts of love was to provide us with that source of strength that would bridge the time period between Christ's first and second coming. You know, he said, I have come, the plan has played through to the point where I have come and I have made that guarantee. I have completed that purchase of each and every child who was willing to accept that invite. And now I must go, but I'm not going to leave you hanging. I'm going to send you that helper, that assist, that power, that very essence of God that will work with you, that will bring you to greater understanding, that will bring those teachings back to mind when you're, when you're starting to slip off and you should respond differently, that's what I'm going to send to you. And so again, when we ask the question, how much does God love us? What has Jesus Christ taught us? And what have we truly been given in a permanent way, really, to lead us to eternity? It's that gift of the Holy Spirit. Scripture tells us in various places that by our human efforts alone, we are capable of achieving, of achieving the righteousness that God expects of us. But we've been offered a helper to stand in the gap and to help us to elevate our game. The Apostle Paul referred to it in Romans chapter 15 and verse 30. Romans chapter 15 and verse 30, he said, As the love that comes from the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit gives us the essence of God, which includes love and joy and peace and patience. All of those in perfect measure. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, 2 Timothy 1 and 7, he refers to God's Spirit as the Spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, if we can get that sound mind around in front of us, then we don't deal with our human nature and our need for justice and fairness. And instead we say, no, wait a minute, I'm supposed to show love, even when, even when it hurts a little bit. For those that have repented and been baptized and committed their lives to following God's way, we're told in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5 that the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. Poured out in our hearts. Sometimes we think of the Holy Spirit as, well, this, this, this little ember, this little essence of God is given, and we have to really work at fanning those flames when indeed it says it's literally poured out in our hearts. We are filled up with it if we accept it, if we understand it, if we embrace it and work with it. John chapter 15 and verse 8. John chapter 15 and verse 8 tells us that our Father in heaven is glorified or honored when we bear much fruit. When we team up with the Spirit that He's provided and we change our lives to look more and act more like Him, God is greatly pleased. We are, again, to develop the fruits of the natural, natural byproduct of that, of that heavenly power, that heavenly gift. And brethren, that means that we need to embrace His instruction to us, that we need to strive to operate in accordance to His law. You know, in Psalm chapter 119 and verse 97, David exclaimed, Oh, how love I thy law. You have shown great love, Father, to me. You have... Given us our spirit today, we know with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that that 
that power was provided, we have the opportunity to access it and, and accelerate because of it. But David said, Father, your law is perfect. Your law makes us understand. And we shall love back to God by keeping that law. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3 tells us that. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. When we work with that spirit, when we come to understand that we are supposed to be loving, then we realize that the first four show us how to show love and interact and build a stronger relationship. What was the definition of that love story? Two that are practicing love, building a relationship, and seeking that satisfying and successful end. When we know that we take that law and we then take the last six, and this is how we interact with mankind, so that we have a stronger, more stable, more loving, more righteous relationship with everyone around. Brethren, they're not going to start it. They don't have the spirit. We're supposed to. So we are the ones that show love then, that model the example of Jesus Christ, that are that city set on a hill and that candle that's not set under a basket but chose the example to the world. So that when they walk through those doors, they're like, yeah, I remember you. Something was a little different. I always enjoyed our time. Aren't you the guy that held the door, or the woman that helped my whatever last week at McDonald's? All those little acts of love that can, that can come into play. Romans chapter 2 and verse 13, getting back to that call to action, it tells us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 13 that we are not to be, or not that the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. That our acts, that our activities, that our generous desire to help others needs to be the product of the love that we feel and that in turn we show. Brethren, in this afternoon's sermon, we've looked at this topic of love. We've seen how love has been shown toward us, showered on us, poured into us, and is expected of us. I started by describing it as a love story. Maybe, that, maybe word got around and that's why some of the congregation left. Oh, really? <laughs> but the love story by definition was the development or the practice and the interaction with love, which leads to a building of a relationship and a satisfying and optimistic end. The plan of God is that ultimate story, brethren. And we have been blessed by being promised a starring role. Most of mankind isn't yet in tune with the program. They're the audience that doesn't understand yet. There aren't enough seats in the auditorium in this particular chapter of the story. And yet, brethren, we have a seat. We have a place to be and a role to play. Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. As we look at the role that we have to play, as we look at the years ahead of us, we can read scripture that tells us it's not always going to be easy. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, but know this, that in the last days, grievous times, or perilous times, depending on the translation you're reading, shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, haughty, railers, disobedient to their parents. You know, we're told to show respect to our parents, love to our parents. So it says that men won't, adults won't, kids apparently won't either. They'll be unthankful, they'll be unholy. Let's drop down to verse 4. They'll be traitors, so they'll turn on each other for a dime or for a favor. They'll be headstrong, not humble, as we're supposed to be. They'll be puffed up. They'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Brethren, we need to make sure that we are, you know, if you picture the scales of justice, we know that we can't, we, we won't overcome all the wickedness that's in this world, regardless of all that we can do. But we are to do our part. And so each day as we go about life, do we say, you know what, I... I contributed to it. Not to do this, 
but to feel that we satisfy the requirement, the teachings, the example of Jesus Christ and our Father in Heaven today by the little bit that we did, the little favor that we did, the smile that we brought to somebody else's face, the letter that we wrote before we laid our head down on our pillow. Jesus foretold of similar conditions in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 10. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 10. So in these later times, he said, and then many will be offended, and many will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Verse 11, it says that false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Jesus, Jesus Christ is at work developing in us his example, and yet that we know that Satan and the devil hates everything about the God family, and the fact, the opportunity that we have to be a part of it. And so he's doing everything that he can to derail us, to tempt us, to sour us. And so we need to be working to make sure that we don't fall into that, that we're, that we're solidly in God and Jesus Christ's camp. Again, because false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Brethren, we can see around us in this world, there are many beautiful things. There are many wonderful people. There are many... Uh, enjoyable opportunities for us. And yet we see the ways of this world more closely aligned with the fruits of the flesh than the fruits of God's Spirit. We need to make sure that we're focusing on the right set and developing the righteousness of character that God expects. And in these tough times, we need to stay focused because of what it tells us in verse 13. But he and she who endures to the end shall be saved. Regardless of how dark these days get, regardless of what your neighbors do to you, how they treat you, those that endure to the end shall be saved. In the end, when Jesus Christ returns, he's promised to set all things right and to open the hearts of this world to his righteous ways, to give them the opportunity to see and understand and accept the invitation that we already have. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 tells us what his plan is, what his activity will be, what his itinerary is already set to do upon that return. Ezekiel chapter 36 and verse 26 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh instead. Brother, there will be a time when there will be no more hate, no more violence, no more greed, No more lying, no more death. Those things will be a thing of the past. But until then, we've had our eyes open to God's truth, and we must swim upstream. We must work against this world's influence and do what we can to influence, influence it on God's behalf. And with God's Spirit and full confidence in His promises, we cling to the words of Romans chapter 8. Verse 38 and 39 in closing here. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Our Lord.